Defeating terrorism, protecting human rights, I believe they're one of the same. We are talking today of, of Sri Lanka in the world arena for the wrong reasons that we are talking in terms of a uh, rule of law crisis in Sri Lanka. I am Buddhist and it pains me to see and hear a Buddhist monk incite hatred against anyone. You know, how can the international community address this situation? And if only more Sri Lankans took did their DNA, they would realise that this ridiculous uh, ethnic stance, centralist stance they take, is just foolish in the extreme. Hello dear viewers, welcome to the What's Right program hosted by PRG, the People's Rights Group based in London, focusing on human rights issues in Sri Lanka. Uh, this is uh, about the first in the series of programs we hope to organize on uh, host on contemporary human rights issues. And I am Lukman Saris, and today we will be taking up the issue of rule of law and impunity crisis in Sri Lanka. To give a, a perspective to this discussion, which is going to follow, in 1948, at the end of uh, World War II, the world said, enough is enough and never again. They then formed the United Nations and also promulgated the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights considered the Ma Magna Carta of modern times. UDHR, as it is commonly known, underlined the uh, rule of law many and human, many human rights as well. Rights which we all deserve by virtue of the fact that we were all born into the human family. 72 years later, as we sit today in this discussion, we see the world around us still crying out for a world order which respects the uh, rule of law and the human rights. Respect for human rights requires the establishment of a rule of law at the national and international levels. The rule of law and human rights are two sides of the same coin of the same principle, the, that's been the freedom to live in dignity. As we know, the rule of law and, and human rights are therefore have an indivisible and intrinsic relationship. So the rule of law, my dear brothers and sisters, is the bedrock of the legal protection for all human rights, whether they are civil, cultural, economic, political, or social rights. So the absence of collapse of these rights, the rule of law, in any state can result in violent uh, oppression or repression leading to gross violation of human rights. So we are talking in this, uh, in this regard, the impunity. The impunity is the primary obstacle in upholding the rule of law. You can see human rights becoming mockery in most countries when those responsible for killings, disappearance, torture, and you know the racist and hate speech being exempted from responsibility. And when judicial systems are not free and fair. So turning to Sri Lanka, our motherlands, once a shining light to the world with a rich civilization. But today, sadly, Sri Lanka sits in the world arena with offering potent lessons to other countries in Asia in its, in, in its cynical adherence in theory to international law while blatantly flouting their substance through the uh, treatment, uh, treatment of its citizens. So the, the Sri Lanka is facing a crisis of rule of law and impunity. You see the crisis, the, the critics talking about a culture of impunity developing in Sri Lanka. We can see the, uh, the in ICG, the International Commission for Jurists, talking about a crisis of impunity and rule of law in Sri Lanka. So in this aspect, we are today to discuss is this deterioration, deteriorating position in, 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 uh, in the world with regard to the rule of law and impunity becoming the new normal or what so the question is being asked in uh, asked to be asked is is this deteriorating situation in the in the, in respect of human rights and the rule of law becoming the new normal what does one explain how does one explain the transformation from a promising dis, uh, di, uh, the, the democracy in 1940s to the state of and present in Sri Lanka. So to discuss this today, we have invited Mr. Juan Uduarage Pereira, who is a dedicated political and human rights activist based in the UK, and he is of Sri Lankan heritage. I'm sure he is well placed to discuss this subject in hand with regard to the uh, human rights issues in Sri Lanka. So to give him a to be a background, he is actually an independent criminal justice administrator and academic and visiting fellow Solent of Solent uh, University and a visiting 
academic in the Raksha Shastri University. And he's also had a lot of professional involvements with Sri Lanka police as well. So, good afternoon, um, Ruan. Good afternoon. Yeah, before we start this interview, uh, is there anything you'd like to say with regard to your profile and your connections with the Sri Lankan police that I mentioned in my introduction. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm a former police officer practitioner here in the UK, uh, where I was um, latterly based at the College of Police in Brams Hill. And in that position, I worked closely with um, the Sri Lanka police and other police services around the world. And then latterly, I've uh, returned to academia and I've continued that association. In fact, I'm currently, um, as you stated, I'm uh, a visiting academic at Raksha Shakti University, uh, which is a pol specifically a police and security university in Gujarat, India. And we're hoping to establish uh, links into Sri Lanka with the University of Colombo. Um, and I say I've worked with uh, senior police officers in um, Sri Lanka for a number of years now and uh, I actually wrote about how impressed I was with regard to community policing um, from around 2000 onwards um, but some of the good practice uh, has seems to have um, been lost shall we say. Okay uh, Ruan before we come to uh, the Sri Lankan scenario let us look at the world at large outside. Um, now, 72 years after the promulgation of the famous uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, today it's, it's common knowledge that the rule of law uh, and human rights are being observed in the breach in most places. Uh, today we can see the emergence of uh, uh, pop waves of populism uh, blowing across the world, especially in the West and also the abuses in respect of, you know, the minority rights. For example, the racism, the xenophobia, the anti-Semitism, and the Islamophobia in being seen on the rise. So in that way, um, as a, you know, um, enforcement, uh, law enforcement expert, how do you see this situation, which is uh, evolving in the world around us? I started at the beginning of the, um, the century, um, having worked on the Stephen Lawrence Inquiry Report, and we thought there was going to be, certainly in the UK, uh, there was a groundswell, we felt, of positivity. And there was an opportunity, we believed, that there was going to be change. Um, and there was start in that, there was start. And around the world there was uh, a lot of positive stuff going on. Crime was going down. Um, no matter what you hear from certain politicians with regard to uh, policies with regard to zero tolerance, uh, they failed actually. Um, crime was generally going down. And so we were focusing far more rightly on community policing, etc. Unfortunately, 9-11 happened. 7-7 happened. And the focus from neighborhood policing, community policing here in the UK and in the, in the USA and in other parts of the world, actually specifically Sri Lanka and South Asia in general, um, was refocused away from community focused policing, intelligence led policing, an evidence based approach to anti-terrorism. Um, and it was a knee jerk reaction. It was not a looking at the causes, it was a very much looking at who were potential offenders. And I say, I must emphasize the word potential because the vast majority of who came under the scrutiny were, had nothing to do with uh, any form of antisocial behavior. So we've seen in a very short period of time, we had a lot of good practice and then it went completely the other way. And unfortunately, since that period, we've had, a, as you say, is the rise of the intolerance. In fact, I was speaking to someone just the other day and they referred to me, they said, in fact, there's been a tsunami of hatred sweeping across the globe. And I think that's a rather good term. Um, it's emanated, I believe, from the West. 
and it's been focused on predominantly Muslims. Um, so the what we once saw as intolerance um, towards perhaps the Jewish people, that's now been refocused towards uh, Muslims in general. And we've seen that in the West with laws changing. We saw that with Donald Trump before he took power, saying uh, he, he, banned, he was going to ban countries, and then he did. Um, and then we've seen sweeping through India, sweeping through Sri Lanka, uh, Myanmar, and elsewhere, we've seen Islamophobia go through the ceiling, absolutely through the ceiling. And it's reflective of 1930s uh, Europe. There's no other, no other way around it. Yeah. Um, the similarities are huge. So it, we've had a really, this century so far has been utterly awful. Um, so we started off well and just went downhill from there. Um, I think it's worth remembering, going back, to, going back a bit, that um, the famous uh, Russian author, um, I'm going to say his name incorrectly now, Dostoevsky, uh, said a society should be judged not by how it treats its outstanding citizens, but by how it treats its criminals. Um, other people have interpreted that in different ways, but I think it's useful to look at that because if we look at how um, how the demonized in society are being treated, we can judge what's going on. And over the last 20 years now, we've seen greater punitive measures being brought in, um, et cetera. So the rule of law is something we should be refocusing on. It's something we always should have. Interestingly, I'll just add there, in t training police officers around the world, uh, if I'd mentioned the rule of law, the chances are actually South Asian police officers, senior police officers, would have been able to have a, and will be able to have a intellectual discussion with me about the principles of the rule of law. Where in the UK, I would have had to explain what I mean by the rule of law, because it's not something um, that actually is commonly uh, referred to, which is actually outstanding, really, considering, um, I say I've been involved in policing since 1982, and it was only since my latter part of policing and then into academia that I truly understood what the rule of law was about. So, sorry to sound depressing there. Thank you, uh, Ruan. That's very insightful. Uh, now, my, uh, you mentioned a very important uh, game changer for the world is the 9-11 that happened, uh, you know, in 2001, and which uh, particularly uh, is, became a game changer for the Muslims all over the world, right? And uh, after that, uh, we know how the United States and the United uh, Kingdom as well got together and, uh, you know, launched this so-called infamous uh, war on terrorism. Now, we all know uh, so many uh, decades later, we know that that became a war of terrorism, ultimately. So, uh, with regard to the human rights aspect, where we knew that how they walked into Iraq and, you know, you know did all those, uh, you know, human rights uh, uh, abuses. Uh, my question to you is that can't the, uh, the war on terrorism and, uh, you know, protection of human rights be compatible? I personally believe they are. Um, defeating terrorism, protecting human rights, I believe they're one of the same. Um, in fact, I believe even in the uh, Sri Lankan constitution, it would agree with that as well. Um, having really read the constitution over the last couple of days for this uh, interview. Um, I was positively, I picked up on the aspects of freedom, equality, justice, fundamental human rights, and the, importantly, the independence of the judiciary. So I believe that if we are, 
focused on terrorism, we should be focused on the causes of terrorism. I'm a criminal justice uh, professional, that's my background. And um, society today constantly wants to look at punitive measures to combat terrorism, um, crim criminality. Terrorism is very similar in the sense of there's a reason why people commit uh, terrorist acts. There's no one definition as to why. Um, but I believe we should be looking at uh, the causes. And that could well be some of the um, things we should be looking at is, is there a connection between deprivation and terrorism? Is there a connection between social inequality and terrorism? Is there a connection between a lack of respect for human rights? And I mean all human rights. Um, the marginalised, those perceived to be terrorists or criminals or deviants, as well as uh, other citizens. Um, is there a connection between what we have definitely been seeing in society, the lack of democracy, the reduction in democracy and terrorism? Um, is there a connection with education and uh, terrorism? And um, also, uh, lastly, I would go with, is there a connection between uh, the predominant religious beliefs of a nation and terrorism as well? Um, so I think in order to um, answer the question, we've got to be asking all the other questions as well. So I do believe it's um, in order to defeat terrorism, yes, protecting human rights, all human rights, must happen so it is compatible i think when it when we actually separate them that's when we've got a bigger problem yes uh, i think you're quite right uh, is one that you uh, who one that we we actually see the uh, the emergence of this terrorism and uh, you know has led to you know the governments of the day using that as a premise to you know violate human rights of this population we, we saw in so many countries and including our back in Sri Lanka. So coming back to Sri Lanka, right, uh, we know that in 1940s, we had a booming economy and a booming country with regard to politic, uh, politically as well as economically as well. But how come, you know, uh, so many uh, decades later, more than 70 or decades later, we are talking today uh, of Sri Lanka in the world arena for the wrong reasons that we are talking in terms of uh, rule of law crisis in Sri Lanka and uh, impunity crisis in Sri Lanka, right? And where the human rights uh, violation has become almost a new normal. And, and with the emergence of the or institution, institutionalization of the racism in, in, in Sri Lankan uh, statecraft. Well, why are we talking in terms of this? As a, a law enforcement expert, how do you view this situation which is emerging in Sri Lanka? Of course, for the wrong reasons. Let me start by saying that um, the institutional discrimination that exists is, it's not just institutional, it's structural. It is part of the, uh, the fabric of the institutions that exist. Um, and that is, uh, it's, it's historical. So it was embedded many years ago. I mean, if, if I just quickly take a bit of history, um, when I, obviously I say, I come from a policing background and I lecture on police and et cetera. And when I speak with people that I say, and even in, in South Asia, um, they believe that policing, modern policing as we know it today, started with the wonderful Pelian print nine principles of policing. That actually are absolutely fan I would, uh, fantastic. I would ask anyone to check them out. The Pelian principles, nine principles of policing. They are valid today as they were in 1829 when they, when they were written. Um, but that's not the history of policing. The history of policing is not uh, Sir Robert Peel in 1829. The history of policing is one that was based in um, actually South Asia and the slave plantations of the Caribbean and the American states. That's where the first policing came from. Um, policing was not about, as uh, my colleagues, former colleagues in the police would have us believe, 
it was about protection of life. No, it started out as a protection of property and keeping the status quo, keeping people in their position. And so I believe actually the policing itself today, there's an element of schizophrenia in there. The, the history of policing doesn't actually uh, fit with the perception that people now put forward. And as we know, if you don't understand your one's own history, then actually we're fall for anything. And we in policing have fallen for this mythology that policing is somehow a community-based thing. It should be, but that's not its roots. So with regard to hate and hate speech, and as I said earlier, I believe uh, it was said to me that there's been a tsunami of hate sweeping across the world. I think that's part of the reason why the police service has difficulty in the criminal justice system, has difficulty tackling hate. Um, because actually uh, the roots of the criminal justice system are embedded in such intolerance. Um, so it has difficulty now challenging that. I've met some of the most physically courageous people like one could ever care to meet within a criminal justice arena. But they're not necessarily ethically and morally courageous in the same way. And um, interestingly, a, a large piece of research was done during the Second World War. Um, an author called Christopher Browning um, did research on policing um, and the police officers who were involved in the death camps uh, and the death squads, the Einsatz Gruppen. Um, and what he found was they were ordinary men. They weren't, there's nothing special about them. They were ordinary men with power. Uh, an extra influence. That is true to this very, very day. Um, and society has this a quite romantic viewpoint of police officers and they expect them to um, be something they're actually not trained to be. And that's something that has to change. So hate speech has been uh, increasing as we know. It's perpetuated by our religious and political leaders, the scurrilous ones, I hasten to add, uh, who would do it to incite hatred. With regard to Sri Lanka, we have seen that. Uh, you know, I am Buddhist, and it pains me to see and hear a Buddhist monk incite hatred against anyone. It is completely against the teachings. Um, and that is about populism. Populism has overtaken the, uh, the true philosophy of many religions and, and also society. And we need to put those, those core beliefs back in again. Um, and the criminal justice system, it reflects the negativity. So if we can, if we can change the, um, the culture that's going on at the moment, actually we will see the criminal justice system start to reflect the positive aspects as well. Go on. Uh, what uh, actually you refer to this emergence of this hate and you call it a hate tsunami, quite indeed, correct indeed. Now, uh, they say that in the, we, we know in the terms of this animal farm, you know, thing they refer to some are equal, uh, all are equal, but some are more equal than others, right? And that's... Yeah. Same thing that I actually uh, observe in Sri Lanka. Now, with regard to uh, the, you know, enforcement of laws or the rights that are being in, enshrined in the constitution of, uh, in Sri Lanka. And also, the, the, the Sri Lanka has been a party to so many international conventions on human rights. So, despite all this, you see the emergence of impunity, where some of these people in uniform or those who are close to the hierarchies of the political uh, political power or those people in uh, saffron clothes being given sometimes special treatment they have they enjoy sometimes immunity uh, against you know the hate attacks which are, which they operate without fear or uh, fear of sanction i mean with regard to this uh, sinandan situation Oh, uh, how do you view this? Now, uh, they say there are adequate laws in the books, the law books, right? Penal code and ICCPR is there, you know, with a lot of laws 
to you know fight hate hatred right and to punish those people who are uh, in, inciting hatred and spreading you know venom uh, venom against uh, you know certain community targeted communities and demonization of communities especially with regard to the muslims uh, in, for example now um, now uh, there is a bit of a you know dilemma irony is that we have lots of laws right to but what is missing i guess is the lack of political will or the the uh, the indifference of the law enforcement authorities you know to you know to to ensure that these people are taken to book or taken to task and then punished but this not, not seems to be happening in sri lanka so as a law enforcement uh, expert how do you view this situation to answer that question i think i need to go back to take people back to what is meant by the rule of law and the rule of law is a, a principle of governance in which all persons institutions entities public private and most importantly including the state itself are accountable to the law um, the law that, that, that is derived from the state and it should be equally enforced um, and it should be independently overseen it should be consistent with international human rights and norm, uh, norms and standards so that is the rule of law now interestingly um, as I said, i've been reading back through over the constitution of sri lanka uh, as an example and that is reflected within the constitution so you're absolutely right you know it's all well and good having the um a fantastic constitution which sri lanka certainly has but if it doesn't actually if the uh, our elected members and our leaders political as well as religious leaders do not follow the constitution which talks about freedom equality justice fundamental human rights independence of a judiciary and most important is to seek and preserve justice and a free society but if if our leaders are not actually reading that and then putting the walking the talk as as we say then we will see the rest of society falling apart as well so i believe there's a lack of leadership genuine leadership um what we're seeing at the moment and we've certainly seen in sri lanka for a number of years now is populism we're seeing it throughout the world we're seeing it in america we've got it here in the uk at this moment uh where we've got political leaders who are they're not following the our in the uk unwritten constitution or in america the, the written constitution they're just coming out with buzzwords um nigel farage intolerance comments um and populism leads to negative it or populism requires to hate something it requires an enemy it requires a demon um and muslims in sri lanka muslims in myanmar muslims well muslims actually throughout the world are an easy target they are such an easy target um and it's old bigotries the stories that are now being told about muslims are the same stories that were told about jews exactly the same stories um and it's quite ironic but some of the people telling repeating those stories claim to be uh in a past life they would have definitely been anti-semites they're now claiming to be um well they're claiming to be pro-israel not claiming to be pro-jewish um they're claiming to be pro-israel because israel government has gone completely to the right as well so this populism is building upon itself and the the revisionism is creating a false reality um now it will come to an end it will come to an end this tidal wave this tsunami will end at some point but i fear how many people are going to be destroyed in that time good people and they, there's lots of them in the in sri lanka and certainly within the public sector and academia um they need to be speaking up they need to be saying enough enough right um ruan you you brought in a very in, a important point of you know the public activism 
playing a very need to the playing to a, a very important role in holding the government to account. We saw the actually the that trend even all over the world in recent times when this Black Lives Movement right came up and uh, you know actually highlighted the need to you know respect the black lives which were actually being you know treated like you know from on the ocean uh, floor so th this is the type of things that we see all the world so back in sri lanka also the public uh, the the public activism was very much alive in 2015 for example when the you know the government changed it was as a result of the leadership that was given by a most respected monk venerable madhuraya sobitotero who led a political revolutionary movement to change the government which was you know thriving on racism and authoritarianism as well as nepotism so in that respect now unfortunately uh, against the governments that followed i mean we, we don't see that type of you know uh, activism being very much alive do you think that the, there is a role of this public activism to play to ensure that the rule of law right and the impunity crisis is sorted out yes to answer answer the question i it's there's no it's not one place that the answer comes from there needs to be a yes there needs to be a groundswell of academics professionals public in general but equally um, we need to go back and make sure the uh, the procedures the practices the legislation is all correct as well now as I say in Sri Lanka the Constitution which I've been reading through again is a fantastic Constitution but clearly the current leadership haven't read it recently it's a bit like Donald Trump holding his Bible upside down outside the church at the Black Lives, uh, one of the Black Lives Matter um, uh, demonstrations. Um, there's a lack of understanding. So we need that to, we need to revisit that. Now, back in the 1998 um, in the UK, at the end of the Irish Troubles uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, they undertook a review. Um, it was called the Independent Commission on Policing for Northern Ireland. And the chair was Chris Patton, who then became um, the last governor of Hong Kong. And it's called the Patton Report. In that report, it primarily looked at a criminal justice system and how the criminal justice system needed to change in order to assist the change in society. Because it has to be a two, it has to be a two way street. Um, there there hasn't been an established uh, democracy where there's been a complete revolution and it remains a democracy in modern history. So we have to do it in a uh, in a different way. We need to use the tools we have. Um, it's not about overthrowing everything. It is about reform and being more ethical and bringing in the fairness and justice so the pan report looked at um, structures so the government and other organizations ngos etc are looking at changing the culture but in order to do that you need to change the structure as well so within the pattern report it looked at how do you embed human rights within policing how do you make the governance truly independent and the governance isn't simply a tool of the state because policing and the criminal justice system is not meant to be a tool of the state, not in a democracy. That, when it is a tool of the state, we have a tyranny, not a democracy. Um, how do we actually embed policing in community? Um, policing a peaceful society? I would suggest that in Sri Lanka, very few people have actually, senior police officers, have actually been trained to police a peaceful society where they're not looking for terrorists, demons, and other things. Um, they're currently, they're coming in from a negative rather than a positive. 
how do we change what principles, what, sorry, policies and procedures do we need to put in place to help change the culture, the ethos of the um, system of society and the police structure or the criminal justice system widely? I mean, it could be as simple as in, say, Northern Ireland, there was a change of name uh, of the police service. One of the aspects, it was the Royal Ulster Constabulary that was seen as very much a right wing uh, reflection of Protestant uh, British imperialism. And so they changed the name to the, the police service of Northern Ireland, which had no uh, negative history to it. They changed the badges, the emblems on the badges. Um, I remember going into a, um, a police station in Sri Lanka uh, in a predominantly Muslim area. And uh, I said to the um, IG, when, uh, sorry, the, um, the inspector of the police station, I, I walked in, I said, uh, out of interest, um, why is there a shrine in the inquiry office? And he looked at me absolutely stunned. And I, he said, well, you're Buddhist. I said, yes, I am. But in Buddhism, we don't need idols everywhere. And this is a predominantly Muslim area. And I do not question your belief in working with the community, but merely our, the uniform of the Sri Lanka police, the, the, the shrine in the, in the inquiry office, etc all imposes another belief system um, and he was absolutely dumbfounded and then I was asked to speak to the IEG police about this as well and uh, unfortunately as soon as I said they said well where did you get this idea from I said well actually it comes from the pattern report and of course unfortunately the pattern report for some reason received uh, was demonized in Sri Lanka now it needs to be picked up again, not as uh, another thing produced in the West and imposed on, on South Asia, because that's not the case. It's an example of how to change. And I would suggest there needs to be some structural changes within the criminal justice system in Sri Lanka to reflect a Lanka approach, a more inclusive approach um, that is less uh, reflective of Buddhism, um, etc. Uh, and the former Sinhalese nation. Now again, I'm, I'm Sinhalese of Sinhalese descent, I'm Buddhist, but I'm challenging whether we need these emblems everywhere, because all they do is actually put other people down, and that is certainly not in the tenets of Buddhism. So I do believe that actually the criminal justice system, if it actually goes back to its roots, um, far more back to its root, genuine roots, rather than the Abrahamic roots that were imposed by the colonial countries that ruled over Sri Lanka. There is an opportunity to actually start becoming more inclusive. Right. Uh, now, it's, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ruan. I, it's very, very useful that you mentioned this sus subject of inclusivity, right? But those are things are well and good. But if you look at the world at large, you can see this uh, rule of law being an impunity being a crisis, not over all, all in Sri Lanka, but all over the world. Even if you look at US, you see there are a lot of things are being, you know, done in the bridge, like what we saw in the case of this Black Lives uh, Movement uh, protest. And also in the UK as well, there are lots of issues that, you know, things are being, you know, uh, the rule of law is being observed in the breach because uh, the so-called uh, universal or the international basis for observing these human rights is, is not being observed as they should. So, uh, because the fact that the, the or any country is no country is island in the political sense. So, if you look at this, how can, uh, you know, how can the international community address this situation of the countries, you know, breaching, uh, even acting against their own constitutions, right? And, and their failure to, to observe or to protect the human rights of its population and to protect their population from human rights abuses. How do you see this situation? Firstly, I have to, um, I find myself having to agree sometimes with people who I disagree with 
in uh, South Asia when it comes to them, them criticizing the West uh, for its hypocrisy in condemning actions in differing parts of the world. When in the West, human rights have not been treated appropriately. Um, here in the United Kingdom at the moment, uh, it talks about being democratic, it talks about all sorts of things, um, the mother of all parliaments, yet at this moment in time I'm living in part of the country uh, in Scotland that is seeking independence from the United Kingdom because it feels it hasn't been afforded the same opportunities as England. Um, Wales is looking at the same and Northern Ireland within a matter of years will if they choose be unified with with Southern Ireland with Aero. Um, so I think I can understand when in South Asia they get they get rather upset with uh, Westerners going over and dictating. Having said that I think there is also the opportunity in South Asia to see the writing on the wall. If the United Kingdom is on the verge of breaking up into separate countries, and the, the questions are seriously being asked now and being discussed, then other nations need to be thinking about their own situation. And their own situation is not gonna be made any better by greater punitive actions, putin punitive responses, putting political uh, opposition down, smothering freedom of expression. Um, that's not going to actually achieve anything other than uh, the total opposite of what they want. In fact, what we've actually seen in, the, in our liberal West, um, we've actually seen the, there's a, there's, a, there's a fine line to walk because our, in our liberal society, we don't want to stop uh, freedom of expression. Uh, but we've taken it completely the wrong way in a sense of we haven't challenged freedom of expression. So, yes, everyone has the right to express their views and we must encourage that. But that doesn't mean actually their views are correct. And those views need to be challenged. And so we've had the growth of extremism in, in the West, Western parts of the world, I believe, now liberal societies, because we haven't actually been very adult in how we've challenged the opposing thoughts and negative thoughts. Um, yes, we must, we must defend freedom of expression, but not all views are correct. So going back to the animal farm bit, really, um, it also 19 is also going back to some more other George Orwell books as well. So um, the West does have, there are some benefits in working with the West. Yes, we, the, Sri Lanka, South Asia mustn't just turn its back on the West, but the West mustn't go around evangelizing as they are prone to do. Um, I say, whilst I was at the College of Policing, it was very much about selling the British policing model. Um, it was only when I then revisited the British policing model I that I realized some of the rubbish I'd been speaking. And subsequently I've been working on how do I undo that. And the work I do now in India and other places is about um, taking the good practice and then seeing how it can be developed further uh, locally there. Yes, Rowan, uh, you know, I think we are running out of time now. Uh, the final question is, uh, I know that so many things can be done intentionally, uh, not focused on Sri Lanka, but, you know, across the world, we have the problem of the United Nations uh, being termed as a non-entity by certain people because of their, you know, the bit of a passive role in uh, world conflicts. And also, uh, the fact remains that whatever we do from outside, but it, it's the people from in, uh, the people internally who should bring about that you know awareness to ensure that the human rights and the rule of law is the bedrock 
of a democratic society. So it's very, very important that that should come from inside, you know, as a public activism wave, right? So that people will be always keeping the the governments of the day uh, on, on, on alert so that they will always stick to the rule of the, uh, the constitution uh, and their human rights uh, that are embedded in it. So uh, my final question is, as uh, you know, I, I know so many things have been uh, discussed in this thing. And uh, what, is, what do you think is the way forward for Sri Lanka? Right, uh, that's my final question to you. Okay, um, that's a huge question. Um, I do genuinely, genuinely believe the answer to the problems in Sri Lanka exist in Sri Lanka and can and will happen. I genuinely believe that. I do believe uh, partially that, um, and again, it goes back to historical, it goes back to Buddhism, for example, the re-emergence of Buddhism uh, from 1948 onwards has taken a nationalistic ethno perspective. Now, that's not Buddhism, um, not at all. There is no ethnicity in Buddhism. Um, I grew up with stories such as if the tooth, if the Buddha's tooth from candy was ever lost, Buddhism in Sri Lanka would be lost itself. Now, what utter dribble. Um, Sri Lanka is an island and always has been of many differing groups. And historically, those communities worked together uh, and lived together and they married together. I had my DNA done last year. And it's no surprise, is it, that actually Singhalese and Tamil DNA is exactly the same. Um, so we are the same people. Um, and if only more Sri Lankans took, did their DNA, they would realize that this ridiculous uh, ethnic stance, centralist stance they take is just foolish in the extreme. We are the same people. If we, if we look back into me, most Sri Lankan families in, in, uh, in Sri Lanka who are still there, there will be, there will be Tamils there, there will be Sinhalese there, there will be burgers there, there'll be all sorts of people there. Um, yet we, over the last few decades, this nationalism has, has just gone completely mad. Um, and they say it's reflective of some pretty dark parts of European history. And we all know where that ended up. Um, and we've seen it happen in Sri Lanka. The end of the world, as you say, end of the world, the end of the war in 2009, um, it hasn't been put down as genocide, but it was almost, it was, it was bordering genocide. In fact, I would say it was genocide, an attempted genocide. Um, but that doesn't mean those people, even those involved in it, can't turn it around, because they can. There is a golden opportunity to turn this around, but that's not following the politics of the West, and, as it has with the right-wing politics, or following the politics of right-wing uh, ironically, right-wing communist China um, in order to feather the economic nest. It's about going back to the roots of South Asia. The ethos of the peoples of South Asia is all based in love, compassion, and being one with the community. That is the ethos of, the, of South Asia. That's the strength of South Asia. So I think, yes, it's great. Sri Lanka is one of the most academic places on the planet. But clearly you haven't learned anything. So we need to go back to our roots. Let's learn again from history and let's rebuild the wonderful island that you and I both love and long may it be there. Um, but it, if we don't learn, but actually, and everyone kills themselves on the island, long will it, will it be there anyway? Um, and that's the reality of nature. So we need to be working together. We are the same people. Um, it's over the last you know, centuries, or whatever, we've become blinded by different uh, little perks that different communities have. So we need to move away from that. 
the, but the opportunity for the future, the answer for the future lies with the people of Sri Lanka. And I'm certainly, you're there. I'm, I'm willing to help, help my family, friends, etc., in Sri Lanka, as you are, as the people of Sri Lanka are. So we collectively can change this. Okay, Ruan, that's where we end this discussion. And uh, may I thank uh, Ruan Rurage Pereira for his time and uh, for sharing his insightful, insightful views with us, with the audience. Uh, now, uh, uh, to summarize that what we are discussing is the, was the rule of law and impunity crisis in Sri Lanka. And we, we actually uh, discussed various aspects of it. And finally, the, the consensus was that it is up to the people of Sri Lanka right, and uh, the public activism that should be running across all communities, coming together to ensure that their human rights are properly protected and uh, that the government are, of the day are being held to account if they actually fail to do so. So thank you very much, Juan, and it's very useful. And uh, in the future, we'll be having uh, more uh, discussions on under the series of What's Right uh, programs and we'll be discussing other contemporary issues uh, pertaining to the human rights with re regard to the Sri Lankan scenario as well as the world at large. Thank you very much. Thank you.